good afternoon and welcome to Moving Through Menopause. I'm here having a chat with Claire Otterwell and uh, Claire is an aromatherapist and a medical astrologer and she has just this fascinating mind full of amazing facts and fabulous information. And so this morning, I'm going to be picking Claire's brains as we uh, navigate through this topic of uh, intimate health. And so uh, not to put too fine a point on it, menopause brings its challenges in this department and vaginal dryness is definitely something that many, many women experience. And, you know, maybe we're not talking about it even yet still enough. So we will be tackling that as a topic area. We'll be talking about the kinds of things you can do nutritionally to help and uh, with natural approaches, herbal medicines and, well, herbal um, remedies, shall we say, and, uh, and also movement approaches. So welcome to Claire. Hello, Claire. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Philippa, on this wet, dark day. Oh, is it wet where you are? It's nice here where I am. It is, yeah. So, um, you know, and I know you have your own experiences of uh, an, uh, a premature surgical menopause. And, uh, you know, and I think that can, the sudden nature of uh, the hormones suddenly disappearing all at once has uh, consequences uh, that are perhaps more pronounced even than those of us who approach it in a more kind of gradual way way um, and so maybe you have some experiences that you can share with us as well I didn't know what you were going to say when you said you've got your own I was thinking you're gonna oh yeah sorry Journey. Uh, yes so um, absolutely so um, I had obviously heard of this this problem I was aware that you know getting a um, dry vagina was part of menopause was expected part of menopause like most of the symptoms we get with menopause which we just accept as opposed to actually looking at fundamentally um, the underlying causes and treating them and I guess that's what we're here to talk about today is the fact that you don't have to just go oh I've got a dry vagina oh dear I'm in menopause and just live with it because it's most uncomfortable for the first thing but yes so my um my entry into the world of menopause was very abrupt and I did experience this problem, not least because I don't have a cervix either. I had the whole lot removed, um, a full filleting, as I like to say. And um, <laughs> I didn't realise that that would have an implication. Certainly when we were discussing that surgically, it wasn't something that came up. Oh, by the way, do you realise that, you know, you're going to be extra dry? Um, and then what dry vaginas actually lead to, which is, you know, smells, um, it can smell more because it's dehydrated, um, which could be really shocking. You're like, oh, what's that smell? Oh, my God, it's me, um, which is horrible. Um, really, really kind of, you know, takes that whole mental health side of menopause to another level, really. And um, the body image and all of that kind of thing. Um, and it, yeah, it's uncomfortable, um, puts you off having sex because you're like, oh God, you know, you feel ashamed of the fact that, you know, you can't be how you were. Mm -hmm. um, and that again has consequences, far reaching consequences for your relationships, your self esteem, how you feel about your body. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. not great, really, is it? The whole um, thing. And the fact that this isn't discussed, which is why we're doing this today. So to say to people, you know, these are the things to look out for mm -hmm. and not to be ashamed of. And these are the things that you can do about it. Um, you I know, guess... Can I just say, do you know what, Claire, you, you said this is something that uh, people know is part of menopause. Well, I didn't. I had no idea. It, it took, I had absolutely no idea that that was even possible. Um, so, so yeah, interesting. And the other thing is, I was watching um, a television medical program uh, the other day, uh, and it was actually uh, it was all about uh, like an STD clinic on television. I mean, honestly, where will they? What will they think up next? 
And uh, there was a young young woman on there who had vaginal dryness. So actually, it isn't necessarily just the domain of the menopausal individual. It, it, you know, it is something that can um, that can just be, a, I guess, a genetic predisposition. I mean, of course, that's what we're here to talk about. But um, it was interesting to me to discover that uh, it isn't just something that you might experience in menopause but that potential you know this may be something that people experience and you know and like you said all that um you know the the lack of awareness the the potential for shame associated around it body image relationships entering into a relationship she was talking about entering into a relationship but when do you introduce into a conversation <laughs> you know the fact that you need lubrication to have enjoyable intimate relations you know when does that come up in conversation <laughs> and so uh, you know and the single women plenty of single uh, middle-aged wonderful women like us claire looking for uh, you know new beginnings and and so again that having that those conversations may in fact be uh, it, it may be something that we have to broach with partners and such like but you know what um Anne Summers, I think she's probably done a lot for for this. You know, in, in as much as it is at least it's on the high street now. Never used to be there, did it? Uh, talking about sex and getting open with um, sharing, <laughs> raising your eyebrows. <laughs> no, it's the word there, getting open. That's what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, getting open. So, so yes, anyway. Yeah, uh, no. Yeah, Sorry. important. No, no, carry on. Oh, I was just going to say that absolutely it's not the domain of just the young person because it's a problem which can be treated um, using the right tools. And it's one of the biggest culprits of um, dry vaginas is dehydration. Uh -huh. And people don't think about that. The fact that, you know, you need to be lubricated all the way through. And mm -hmm. if you don't drink enough water, then your skin cells are going to... Well, you're, is going to dry out so that creates a problem in itself so that's a really quick and simple way of tackling um a dry vagina is making sure that you're properly um watered up and lubricated mm. like people aren't eating enough good fats or enough omegas three six nine we need these good fats in our diets our brain is 60 percent fat if you don't give your body the right resources then you can't expect it to do its job properly. It's simply that. And we live in this culture where everybody is so obsessed with being kind of, you know, micro size, <laughs> size zero, looking like this, et cetera, not eating carbs, not eating this, not eating that. And the balance has gone out of nutrition and that's having a detrimental effect on people's skin elasticity, not getting enough vitamin C. That's another massive one. Vitamin C helps you to build collagen. Collagen gives you stretchy skin you need collagen throughout your body. So it's kind of like eating, um, I'd supplement. If I had a dry vagina, which I um, luckily don't because I do take a lot of vitamin C and supplements, etc., then that's what I'd be recommending to people. Take more vitamin C, take more omegas, um, look at your diet. What are you eating? Are you drinking enough fluids? Are they the right fluids? That kind of thing. If you're gonna drink a lot of alcohol, and quite often a lot of alcohol can lead to sexual intercourse, um, then, you know, you've got to, it does, doesn't it? Can do, can do. Can do, inhibitions go, all that kind of stuff. And just to be aware of the fact that, you know, that's quite dehydrating. So you kind of, you're creating the perfect storm. Um, mm -hmm. Just got to think about these things. I was reading that um, one of the great tips you can do with your Amiga, um, it's uh, the... Um, primrose oil, evening primrose oil, is you can actually put a little hole in one of your capsules and use that internally. And that gives you a nice natural lubricant. So that's the kind of, you know, on the go um, when you're caught out. Well, I don't know that I have an evening primrose oil capsule in my handbag, Claire. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have to get some now, though, of course. Um, you know, so the thing of, you know, with regards to lubrication, like you said, from within uh, to begin with, definitely hydration, massive. It's, it's, we're massively dehydrated, so many of us, uh, so much of the time. 
And so, um, you know, the fluids, the right fluids, rather than, uh, you know, lots of coffee and tea draining us, uh, draining us dry. And, and fizzy drinks, things like that, things with sugar in them, anything that your body's going to have to use more water, more of its resources to get yeah. rid of, basically. Yeah, I always think, I'm always reminded of uh, of uh, school, chemistry at school, and the semi-permeable membranes, you know, and the, and the water on one side, and the molecules, more molecules on one side, and less molecules on the other, and the tendency for this... Um, well, it's homeostasis, isn't it? But the balance, so that if you're if you're ingesting something that is highly concentrated, then the tendency is for the water to be pulled out of the cells, rather than you know the opposite, which is to to use clear fluids that don't have sugar or salt in in them, and then the fluid is more likely to be going into the cells. Yes, a big culprit of that is dried fruit which people think, oh, eating dried fruit, oh, that's going to be really kind of, you know, healthy, that's a great health alternative. But it needs to be rehydrated for the body to use it. So it's really dehydrating and can lead to quite a lot of kind of flow problems. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? I never kind of, I would never have thought of that. Um, but um, I have, I have done a what do you call it when you fill your fr oh i know making christmas cake that's when i've done it you have to kind of rehydrate it before you yeah. put it in christmas cake so you know if it's good enough for a christmas cake it's good <laughs> for really that brandy that you're putting in the christmas cake so mm -hmm. i wouldn't rehydrate yourself with brandy no probably not so hydration definitely important and then the nat the fats you know, like you say, nutritional fads, the food industry has just jumped on board this whole, you know, health food uh, kick, which, uh, you know, to label foods healthy or low in sugar or low in fat, and usually invariably uh, th those are filled with all sorts of other ingredients that are nutritionally devoid of, uh, of uh, well, nutrition. <laughs> benefits yeah absolutely nutrition and uh yeah so well, someone here is just telling us that they definitely agree that we've got to rehydrate our um dried fruit i it hadn't occurred to me to, to be fair but so anyway um yeah you know the, the fact that food is just because it's got a green traffic light on it doesn't make it a health food in my book and the fact that it's in a packet at all probably is is giving you a clue you know so uh, stick with whole foods single ingredient foods and then just put them together in your own kitchen um or oh, i was just about to say oregano but what i meant was avocado <laughs> which is great yeah i would love avocado you mm. could put it on your face you could eat it i mean i'm not sure if it goes anywhere else claire i was just thinking that, and I wouldn't recommend that. Could be messy, but could be fun. Depends yeah. where you want to take things, but um, certainly an excellent thing to eat and full of very good fats and the fats that we need. And yeah, you're right, the, health, the food industry has done a real number on fats and they haven't actually explained to people what they want is the good fats, not the bad fats. Mm -hmm. And so people just read fats and go, oh no, I don't want any of those. And they're actually starving their brains and their bodies of essential building blocks to keep them well really yeah so lots of good fats and and to keep the tissues hydrated um any are there any sort of uh we were talking about lubrication and you mentioned evening primrose oil and i know that i did a podcast not very long ago with um with a lady lavinia forgotten a second name and lavinia works uh, alongside the yes company who provide who manufacture and um uh, and sell natural lubricants and uh mm -hmm. and i just i just remember that she was talking about the water based versus oil based and this potential for interacting with a condom oil based lubricants can uh, interact with condoms and potentially make them ineffective so if if that is a concern then, uh, you know, any advice that we give, obviously, it's always important to do your homework 
and make sure, because there is always the exception that proves the rule, isn't there, Claire? Absolutely. And as you're right, it is, well, it, everything is down to the individual ultimately is to choose what they choose to use because what may work for one may not work for another. And then you've got the whole thing with condoms of latex free versus latex and mm -hmm. where you go with that. So you've got yeah. to make sure. I mean, I think, I think that's right. You know, even just as far as down to your underwear, um, cotton underwear, breathable underwear, synthetic fabrics, um, maybe the stretchy, maybe they uh, have invisible nickel lines, but uh, you know, they're really no good for, for the uh, flora and fauna. Of the vagina, no, then definitely not. Um, and that goes with anything that you put on your body. So if you've got these issues, you've got a dry vagina, you need to make sure that you're not using perfumed um, body products to try and kind of eradicate smells or change things up. That's going to add to the problem. And as you're right, disturb the kind of micro flora and fauna, which is it's just not worth it. And there's so many natural ways that you can kind of improve um, the way you smell by using more natural products, because we are literally what we put on our bodies and in our bodies. So underwear, clothing, deodorants, like I know there's a really big thing about American women like to put douche up their designers to try and help them smell nice. And I just think, God, you are literally just wiping out all the kind of good bacteria. Mm. So it, well, that's right. And it is, you know, we do have a microbiome in, in these, uh, you know, the nasal microbiome, the gut microbiome, and then the vaginal it has a, 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 a colonized in a way that, uh, you know, if the colony's good bacteria, then everything's going good. And, and if we get out of balance, then that might be a time when you get um, odors, say. And so, like you say, washing them all out isn't necessarily the way forward, is it? No, um, absolutely. And yeah, and that makes me think of thrush as well, which can be a byproduct of kind of getting your microbiome out of balance down there which is created by the underwear by being dehydrated by just not looking after your help because the candida kind of gets out of balance doesn't it and creates the thrush um well you know i've always had very dry skin all over my external body and uh, and it didn't really translate into the mucosal membranes yeah. luckily i guess <laughs> Yeah. Um, but what? So what that meant was I have very sensitive skin, and so I've never been able to use a biological washing powder. Say, for instance, I've never used um, clothing conditioner. I've never used things that you put in your tumble dryer to make them smell nice. I've I've never used perfume shower products, or uh, you know, I mean, the tampons can have perfume, toilet paper can have perfume, and what's the other thing? Panty liners can have perfume. So all of these are things that potentially, that maybe once upon a time, you your body could deal with that. But, um, you know, for me, I think it, it, what I noticed is things that I was maybe sensitive to before, I'm even more sensitive to now. And so it might be that you were not at all sensitive to any of these things previously, but that we can acquire these sensitivities, particularly as we as we pass through time. And I sound like a Doctor Who there, don't I, for a minute? <laughs> Just step in the TARDIS and travel through time. Anyway, so, uh, but you know what I mean? So things, they, 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 you know, we're, they're always trying to sell us something to make us smell good. And, and actually, what do, what do we love to make us smell good, Claire? We love the oils. I love the aromatherapy oils. Absolutely. So exactly. And they're so natural, they're not going to cause any compromise. I wouldn't necessarily advocate putting them inside mm -hmm. your vagina. But you know, if it was an issue, and you wanted to kind of, you know, scent your pants, then you might consider adding a few drops to your washing load. And that way you can make your clothes smell nice, especially if you use a kind of natural washing. Um, like I've got a ball with soap nuts in it. Um, if anybody's using those kind of things, that's how you add kind of nice smells into your laundry or even a, just a drop of lavender oil in your um the gusset of your pants you know is not going to cause any problem and is actually going to be quite beneficial um it's not going to disturb the um floor and fauna. i mean obviously i'd rather you treated it from the inside 
mm. by making sure you're eating and drinking and not using any um, artificial creams or creams full of all these nasty preservatives which imbalance that microbiome but you know if you were really someone that was just like this is so important to me mm. and I'd say okay let's use essential oils let's try lavender which is really skin friendly and um full of lots of lovely properties that are antibacterial mm. in like bad bacterial and things like that it, it's a gentle mm. one I think you know for me this has been a lifestyle for, for just as forever um, and so it isn't, it, it's entirely natural for me to do these things. For people who have, you know, been able to use scented products and perfumes and, and, and also um, you kind of get used to the fact that everything sm smells of something, you know, oh. whereas in my house, every, nothing smells of anything because, and what's quite funny is now everybody in the house is allergic to this stuff. So we go on holiday and I was the one who was allergic and and then obviously I had chill. So now we all go on holiday. If we go in a hotel, we all end up with a rash from the bed sheets or something. Seriously, because we, we just can't tolerate the um, the scented perfumed uh, laundry detergents or whatever it is that they're using. So, um, you know, it, it may be alien territory for you, but, but that's, you know, removing these toxins essentially from products uh they're toxic to the body aren't they really they're, they're not not they're good artificial us. chemical induced aromas absolutely and i have to confess that when i went to a girls boarding school and so you know vaginal health you know all of this stuff was really kind of we discussed it but we were like oh horrible you know this part of your body was so shameful mm -hmm. and so you did everything you could not to have any scent at all and whether that be scented tampax scented panty liners you know so i've done it all and also being very sensory i love smells so before i knew better as a young um lady obviously i was a lady um, <laughs> i really enjoyed anything that was scented because i didn't know what i was doing um, luckily it didn't really affect me um very much but Obviously, I know better now, and certainly I've never used anything artificial in probably the last 20 years. Yeah, well, so, I, I just know the, tes the Tesco the other week, they brought me some scented toilet paper, which I would never buy normally. They snuck it in there as a substitution, and I didn't notice. And I was using this this paper, and before you knew it, I was in a pickle. Um, <laughs> I was in a pickle and I, you know, so, so it, you can't believe that something so irrelative, what you would think it's innocuous. And yet, uh, for me, that was definitely a no, no. So if there are, if you are having troubles, think of all these, um, simple solutions before we start to, to go down the route of uh, prescription medications or, um, you know, yes. Yeah, absolutely. 100% behind you and let's talk about movement because as we were discussing like um one of the most important things and kind of where things can go wrong is the buildup of toxins in the body which can create this dryness as well you know you're not you're not hydrated things aren't moving along things start to smell it's uncomfortable it's dry and one of the best things to do is to get that lymph system kick start it and to use movement to bring blood to the area. So let's hear what you get. Give us tip wise on movement, Philippa. Well, you know, I, I think there is not a health topic that we can talk about where movement is not beneficial. And, uh, and so generally increasing the blood flow around the body is going to prevent, help to guard against dementia. And you know what, it's, it's uh, we've got dementia month, is it, or week or something? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's around now. Somebody was uh, posting about it yesterday. Uh, your eyeballs, you know, we can guard against macular degeneration just by doing cardiovascular type exercises, getting the heart rate up. And so there's no bit of the body that doesn't benefit from, from us pumping the blood around the body. Um, and so increasing the heart rate with whatever you do. And so... What we do know is that high intensity aerobic exercises increases the heart rate undoubtedly, 
But sometimes, uh, you know, high intensity exercise can be overloading on our joints, say for instance. It may be that you're carrying injuries, that you, you're not able to participate in those kinds of activities. It may actually be that you've got a, a weak pelvic floor that makes you precludes you from doing things like running or uh, star jumps. That's that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Star jumps. laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing, but uh, so you know, under those circumstances, we know what we do know is that resistance training is going to increase the blood flow around the whole of the body, and and without maybe some of these uh, these potential side effects. So I, I am all about building the muscles at the minute. Um, <laughs> Claire knows this. I do. I go to your classes. I think they're amazing. Oh, that's very kind. So, uh, so yeah, resistance training, body weight resistance. You might use a rubber band or you may use a, a dumbbell or something. And to uh, by increasing the resistance, we just increase the intensity of the work and therefore we, the heart is going to be pumping the blood around the body. Using the big muscle groups, the legs, you know, we've got, that's going to be taking the blood around the body. And the other thing, of course, you talked about there was lymphatic flow. And uh, I haven't done a Pilates or a yoga class when I got to the end where I didn't need to go to the bathroom. And that is because this the muscle activation is stimulating the lymphatic flow. Um, and actually, I was talking to, uh, and so that's, you know, promoting this dispersal of toxins. But I was talking to somebody, and there is there's an invention where you can put your legs into uh, something that pumps air and squeezes your legs. In the back in the day in the hospitals, we called it the flow tron, and you would use it in a, in a medical context for people who were at bed bound, you know, and they couldn't get out. So we're preventing clots, blood clots, by uh, using this machine, and it pumps and squashes the calf muscle, and then it releases and pumps and releases. And the, and so basically, this this machine they sell this machine, and sports people use it so that um, it's a, basically it's like a passive way of exercising the lymph pumping the lymph around the body guarding against uh, delayed onset muscle soreness um, so the lengths some people will go to not <laughs> not to do exercise although i guess for people that really are as you say in a position where they can't then at least there's that but for everybody else you could body brush as well that's so oh simple God recommend daily body brushing and body brushing every single morning after my shower and that's a fabulous way of getting the lymph system going it really is. it really is and the, so the lymph has no pump does it it's it, the heart the circulation has the heart to pump it round, and the lymphatic system has no pump uh, and so we've got to assist and you and really it is the muscles contracting and releasing contracting and releasing that is going to pump the lymph around the body um, and so you know that exercise will bring oxygen to all the cells oxygen is you know the fuel that's needed for the cellular processes to take place along with the nutrients obviously and then of course you know we, we can't talk about vaginas without talking about pelvic floor exercises and so specifically targeting the muscles can guard against the atrophy that can occur because obviously dryness is one thing, but vaginal atrophy where this, the mucosal tissues are actually thinning and then becoming prone to tears. And so tears are excruciatingly painful. The dryness, uh, the friction that can arise as a consequence of dryness is, is uncomfortable undoubtedly. But the pain associated with um, with tears is excruciating, and and so to prevent the atrophy of tissues, you know, exercises specifically for the vaginal tissues is is indicated, and so we mentioned jumping on the trampoline as well, didn't we, Claire? And the need for panty liners may just be averted if if we are doing these kinds of exercises on a regular basis. So. The, the thing that lots of people are a little bit confused about is, is how to do a pelvic floor contraction and what it feels like when you're actually doing one. And so there's a couple of 
ways in which people make mistakes. And the key one is to contract the bottom muscles, that is the gluteus maximus, the big bottom cheek muscles. Now, if you see me going up and down here, Claire, can you see me just brief, like slightly going up and down? So if you're going up and down, if you're sitting down, you're going up and down, when you think you're doing pelvic floor exercises, then that's not what you're doing. You're tightening the bottom muscles and that is not the pelvic floor. So think about the pelvic floor and the diaphragm as two domes which mirror one another. And when the diaphragm goes up, that's as you exhale. And when the diaphragm goes down, that's as you inhale. So think of the diaphragm inhaling the air into the lungs. It's drawing the air down. And so the cylinder around your torso and then the diaphragm is the ceiling and the pelvic floor is the, the floor. And these two structures, uh, let me get that right, mirror one another in the way in which they move. So it's important, or uh, one way of facilitating pelvic floor is to ensure that we are performing the contraction at the appropriate moment. So if you're trying to contract your pelvic floor, uh, lift it up, that is, as you're bringing your diaphragm down, you can see this is creating pressure in the cylinder. And so actually it's better to, or easier to, to generate this activity in the pelvic floor as you exhale because the diaphragm's going up, reducing the pressure in the cylinder. Think about your pelvic floor like a diamond shape. And the pubic bone is at the front and the end of the coccyx or the tailbone is at the back. Now, if you were stood up or sat down, the diamond would be this way, parallel with the ceiling. I'm showing you the diamond this way. That's if you're lying down. <laughs> so the two bones in your bottom are the two points at the side, yes? The mm -hmm. bones that you sit on are the two points at the side. So we can think about sh making the, di the diamond smaller from front to back. We can think about making the diamond smaller from side to side. We can think about making the diamond smaller from front to back and from side to side at the same time. Yes? Right. We, can think, we can think about all the different openings. And us gals, we've got three openings and uh, for the most part, and the chaps just have the two. Okay? So closing around the openings is another way of contracting the muscles of the pelvic floor. And of course, we've got the three openings. So you might think of the openings at the back, the opening at the back, the opening in the middle, and the opening nearer to the front. And so we're getting right down into the detail of being able to isolate movements to a very specific part of your body, which is something that we practice a lot in Pilates. Uh, you know, this ability to connect your mind to those muscles and to, um, and to generate tension in the bit of the body that you are targeting rather than it being diffuse and all over. We can isolate. And so that's a skill that really comes into its own when we are learning these pelvic floor exercises. Um, and so what I would ask people to do as a beginning point is to inhale through the nostrils and then as you exhale, to think of closing around the openings and to begin maybe at the back, go to the middle and then the front opening. And then as you inhale again, just allow the relaxation to occur because it's important that you can differentiate between tension and relaxation, tension and relaxation. Uh, we don't want to generate overactivation either because that wouldn't be good uh, either. So, uh, you know, another thing that can be helpful is to sit on something like a, a ball because um, when your uh, perineum is the technical term, when your perineum is in contact with something, you're getting some sensory feedback and that's going to help you to come to kind of understand a bit more about the bit of your body. Um, and so sitting, we use these in Pilates, don't we? These soft Pilates balls, literally sitting on it so that uh, it's underneath your perineum and I sit cross-legged like this. So I, I, I'm right on it. So I'm in no doubt where my perineum is because it's in contact with this ball. 
and then I can I, I can really focus my mind on it because I, I'm aware of that sensation and then I can think maybe more easily about those bits of me. And then the other thing that I heard uh, the other uh, some time ago was to think of the pelvic floor like uh, lifting up the centre of a handkerchief. I'm using this fabric here. So that when you're lifting in the pelvic floor, think of lifting in the centre of a handkerchief. So the vagina is in more or less in the middle of this, you know, front to back area. And if you're thinking of lifting in the middle, generating the lift is what you're thinking of. Um, and to do longer holds and shorter, more rapid contractions, a combination of both of those, because that's what you need for function. You know, when the cough comes along to catch you out, uh, I'm sure there were lots of people dreading coronavirus, if only for the pelvic floor, you know. I, w <laughs> I wasn't looking forward to it, <laughs> thinking incessant coughing, you know. Um, anyway, so, uh, so thinking of lifting the handkerchief, coordinate with the breath. And, uh, and then last of all, there is something that you may, I know we've talked about, which is called hypopressives. And, uh, and this is something that we do do in yoga, creating a vacuum inside the body. And by creating a vacuum in, the, uh, in this cavity, invariably you're going to generate lift in the pelvic floor. So to create the vacuum, if you remember, generally when you're doing this, you would lean forwards and uh, in a forward kneeling kind of position. I'll, I'll do it on all fours, just for the sake of argument. And uh, I'll show you my actual flesh. And uh, as I know, <laughs> that's my actual flesh cake, can you believe it? So I'm uh, just letting it be there, you know, I'm not doing anything. And then if I exhale, <sighs> emptying all the air out of my lungs, and then hold the air out of my lungs empty, I'll do that in a minute when I'm not talking. And then I'm going to draw the contents up towards the spine. So letting all the air out of my lungs. I'm empty. And then I'm drawing. Wow. You look like a whippet. <laughs> Don't hit me yeah. And then let it go. I look like a whippet. That's it. You do. That's amazing. And I do remember doing that. And I do remember you telling me. And I find it really powerful. Yeah, so it's basically creating a vacuum inside you. It's going to cause your pelvic floor to lift. And this is called hyperpressives, and there's a whole hyperpressive movement uh, out there. So, again, if you were standing up, in exhaling all the air out of the lungs, and then generating that. So you can see the difference when I breathe then. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> yeah, it's great. By the vacuum, then you allow, you, you're actually creating lift in the pelvic floor because, you know, the key thing with the pelvic floor is really knowing you're doing it right. You know, and the final thing is to actually insert a finger because when you're in the shower, just insert a finger and have a go at doing your pelvic floor and if you're not feeling anything on your finger, then you know that that there's, you know, it's not happening. And maybe you, you, two fingers might be more appropriate. Uh, <laughs> depending, depending how many nine pound babies you had, like me, Claire. Yeah. That was my uh, immediate thought. I think that depends on how many children you've had. Yeah, a couple of nine pounders with big heads. I had big babies too. Did you? I know, and it, you know, and like I said, I think I've re I wrote about this. Number one, I felt like I really got away with number one. Number two, definitely, uh, uh, no. Anyway, so so, did you learn anything? Is there anything new there? Did you know it all already? I didn't know. I mean, I obviously know that females have three holes. I am female, but I didn't know because I don't get a lot of sensation around my urethra. Mm. Urethra. Mm. And so I didn't know that I was supposed to include that in a pelvic, and I wouldn't even know how to because that area in me, it's been repacked as mm. part of my um, 
surgery um, doesn't carry a lot of yeah sensitivity or sensory information. So would that just would that just be included when I was doing things? I mean, can you isolate that part of your body. Can you really pelvic floor it? You yeah, can. yeah. So this is you know, and that's pretty key for uh, stopping the flow of urine. If you if you think about it. Mm. Um, so, so yes, the thing is, I know what you mean about s sensation. Um, and I think when I, when I do that contraction around the front opening, the urethra, as you say, you know, I, I'm not feeling the tube. It's not yes. the tube that I'm feeling, but it is definitely forward of the vagina. There's when, more in the clitoral area, I would say. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. more there, just yeah. to kind of put a lot yeah. into it. But yeah, no, just in terms of uh, practicality, then yeah, yeah, okay. That makes sense. I can kind of get there then. Right, okay. So now we know where that is. So yeah. uh, after 50 odd years, we, we've just about <laughs> established where that is. I'm 45, I'm not 50 yet. Oh, sorry. Well, no, I'm, I'm talking purely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So Claire's 45, but oh yeah. Uh, and so prematurely menopausal, sadly, for, for Claire, which, uh, but you know, maybe not. The wisdom has come to Claire even sooner. How about that, Claire? Oh, absolutely, and I don't miss my periods at all. Uh, and I think there's a lot more women that have surgical menopause than you would necessarily think. I know these things go in and out of trend, yeah. Um, and they went out of trend, but I think they kind of come back in because I've met lots of women or spoken to lots of women, clients, etc., that have gone through this as well. So yeah. Yeah. Um, we include all of them, but yeah. And the menopause is a brilliant experience um, once you know how to treat your symptoms and, as you say, the wisdom and, you know, the freedom that it brings you afterwards. Um, I'm just going to give a couple of other organic uh, lubricants that people might like to try. Okay. Um, you can use extra virgin olive oil, not something to use with a condom though, because that's an example, as you were talking earlier, about something that might be compromised and might compromise the integrity of the condom. So if you are using condoms, then you might want to think of an aloe vera based oh. lubricant, because that is a water based lubricant and won't compromise your condom. Uh, vitamin E oil. Um, extra virgin coconut oil is a very popular one because if we think oh, about that, it's I, like that. <laughs> I have I love that I love that stuff well yeah. now you know where you can put it and well, because it's solid it can you can you can easily apply it um and mm -hmm. it's not going to cause it I mean obviously it goes running on contact with heat but mm -hmm. it smells lovely and you know that's just such a natural smell so anybody that's really into coconut and then there's CBD oil, which has the added benefit of a bit of pain relief. So if people are feeling really tender down there um, because they're dry, or they haven't had a lot of action, or what, for whatever reason, CBD oil is something you might like to apply down there safely as well, which will help um, with some of the pain. There are oils that can do that as well, but I'm, we're looking for that really oily consistency, really and most oils aren't that. Um, yeah, and certainly when I did that podcast, she was talking about having to sort of reapply, particularly with the water-based, um, particularly with the water-based reapplication during, you know, uh, intercourse. I know, I know. So somehow you have to bring that in. <laughs> I, uh, well, anyway, the water-based is more likely to be absorbed, isn't it? Because, you know, that's the whole... But that does reach a point if you're eating right, drinking right, oh, where yeah. you will be, your mucous membranes will be sufficient, sufficiently kind of um, plump yeah. and hydrated and oiled up. So I would say if you're literally putting on water-based lubricant and it's disappearing at a faster rate than not, then you basically are seriously dehydrated. Oh, okay. so that's something to think about. Yeah, that's that's yeah, you make a good point. No, somebody said about the coconut oil. I like that. It keeps, keeps it clean. Yeah, I, I, I never. It never occurred to me to try that, but uh, I, I love coconut oil. What was what was it the other day? Something, anything that smells of coconut, I'm there. You know, I love it. So, 
Makes people feel like they've gone on holiday. How to add a holiday vibe to the bedroom. Holiday romance with your coconut oil. Drink some Malibu and you'll be, oh, no, we shouldn't because we don't want to get dehydrated. <laughs> anyway, as I love our conversations, and you know I do. Um, I, I have an appointment that I need to uh, depart. So, And I'm sure you've got lots of things to get busy with. Children, Claire, I isn't do. it? I, yes. Part, yes, let's not talk about children, but absolutely. And also, yeah, I've got a short period of time left before I have to go and collect them. But I hope everybody feels that they know a lot more about vaginal health and dryness and than they did before they got on this call. And they've got lots of useful tips and tricks from us on how to um, be well. Yeah, be well. So take care. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Yes. And we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Take care. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.